Welcome to The Authority File, the podcast that features conversations about the life cycle of scholarly communication. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. In this series, which is brought to you with generous support from Taylor and Francis, we're going to be talking about open access, but from the publisher's point of view. In order to meet the requirements of open access distribution of scholarly content, publishers have spawned a variety of new content models. I mean, talk about a pivot. Joining me on the next four episodes is Jamie Hutchins, Director of Open Research Americas at Taylor and Francis. Jamie will be sharing the progress of the publisher's new open access book publishing pilot called Pledge to Open. It's a collective model, meaning libraries from a variety of institutions fund the program, and when the fund meets its threshold, titles are made available open access to everyone. Jamie will be discussing that along with the program's unique combination of humanities, social sciences, and STEM titles focusing on global issues inspired by the UN's Sustainable Development Goals Initiative and how the publisher helps academic libraries navigate the transition to open access. In this second episode of our series, Jamie and I talk about Pledge to Open, a new open access pilot program from Taylor & Francis that is based on a collective funding model. So let's talk about the uh, Taylor and Francis's uh, Pledge to Open pilot. Sure. Um, that was launched uh, last year, right? Yeah, we put the, the first sort of communications out early last year in 2023. Um, it, it really sort of started to to become something we focused on um, in fall 2023. Mm-hmm. And then really as we have got through the year, the, the intention was to uh, I'll talk, maybe I'll talk a bit more through the pledge to open itself, but we had a, a funding um, threshold that we were looking to develop over the course of a year. Um, it's running through to the end of July 2024. Mm-hmm. And the, the intention there is to is really to look at books specifically. So right. we wanted to build a collection of books, um, engage with a community to assess whether they would work with someone like TNF to, to build a collective funding mechanism. And then the idea really is uh, a collection of 70 books spread across seven different collections and focused on or inspired by the United Nations um, SDGs. Mm. Um, And then this is really like a, an intention or very intentionally what we were trying to do is merge together traditional subject areas into something that would discuss a complex global issue as comprehensively as possible. So rather than putting books into traditional buckets of uh, particularly like humanities and social sciences or STM, yeah. um, actually where you're looking at something like climate change, you need to think about policy. You need to think about economics. You need to think about healthcare. Um, mm-hmm. You need to think about the science and you know, material science and, and doing that as comprehensively as we can within a, a relatively small collection just to test a business model as well. Yep. So what was, you know, Kind of going back to the impetus, I mean, what, what inspired the uh, choice to, to start something like Pledge to Open? Yeah, p- partly it comes from customers, really. Yeah. So we, we talked quite upfront, really, about um, maybe some of the challenges with BPCs, especially. Mm. So if you imagine that for a book, there's, there's kind of a, a risk measure, if you like, as a publisher with every book that you commission. Um, you have to imagine that it's the right topic, the right author. Um, there's, an, there's a market for that book. There's um, going to be institutions who want to purchase it later on. And, and more importantly, there's going to be somebody who wants to read it. And for a title, I said, with maybe multiple hundreds of pages, sometimes multiple <laughs> authors as well, uh, with an edited text. There's more of a risk with each of those publications than perhaps with a journal article where obviously we, we publish thousands of those within each journal typically. Mm-hmm. The, the sort of cost involved in, in actually publishing a book is more significant than it is at a, an individual article level and therefore the book publishing charge is quite significant. Uh, and so the collective model is really an attempt to try and see whether there is a, a group of institutions that will band together to provide a fund at a lower level per institution to make those books globally available. So there's a there's an equity angle in here as well in that we're trying to 
to allow authors who won't typically have access to those funds mm -hmm. uh, a way to publish. And also for quite a lot of institutions who are looking to have more global impact for their budget and to see if they all work with TNF to develop that program. So, so the pilot was relatively small for us, at least. Um, we, we publish over, over, I think, nearly 2,000 books a year. Um, so 70 books is a relatively small. But the idea was to test the model, um, learn from it, and to try and build a community that will work with us to, to, to extend that out into a, a bigger and hopefully more sustainable program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a side note, we see an awful lot of those books come through the choice reviews um, oh, that, oh, that, workflow. Yes. So yes. yeah, um, I can attest to that to that volume. Um, so what were you know some of the? There's a variety of models out there for this kind of thing. And, you know what what were you looking at at the time? And, and you know and you mentioned the SDGs. Like why uh, why did that become why did those become a motivation for you as well? Yeah, interesting. I think this is a move. Again, very much um, popularized, I think, in Europe. Mm. So um, one of the challenges we found is actually having to educate about the SDGs in, in the Americas, uh, which are, I think a lot of schools are aware of, but they haven't really sort of moved it into their purchasing or acquisition um, processes at this point. So um, the, one of the challenges really was it's an identifiable collection that we don't have within our systems currently. So you can't buy an SDG collection from TNF at this point. So it was starting to test the editorial side of our business to say, is there an appetite for this kind of material? Mm -hmm. the, the other thing was making it distinct within our program as well. Um, and TNF has a quite a high profile in uh, what's called the SDG Compact with a group of publishers who come together to try and promote these particular um, issues and to ensure that their programs do try to tackle these, these very important global challenges as well. Uh, and we hadn't done that before, and we hadn't done it in a book form previously either. And then the, the business model was really, um, again, customer calls. So we've, we've talked to multiple customers who look to have something outside of our standard acquisition model. Uh, and we think there's, a, there's an appetite really to work collectively. And I think that's where we're seeing individual libraries saying, I, I can't achieve much with my budget. But if I can work with a group of other like-minded institutions, can I achieve more from my limited mm -hmm. budget? So, so we had to build those ideas into our business model. We wanted to allow you know, a, a relatively small humanities-focused teaching school to be able to contribute alongside one of the sort of research BMOs that we have up in the Northeast here, for instance. Yep. So who, who would you consider to be partners on this project? Well, we consulted with a lot of institutions so we you know we have a bit we have business relationships with close to 2000 institutions across the americas so mm -hmm. that, we've got plenty of people we can talk to <laughs> um we're also part of you know, multiple initiatives across the industry as well so we, we're partnering with other publishers um so as i mentioned the sdg publishers compact um, that's one source of information and we're, we're sharing info um, across publishers there to sort of see where where we've seen potential for us as an industry to have a wider impact so that that's that's one aspect is that is that editorial sort of exchanging editorial perspectives or is it it's actually more, more sort of high level than that it's really thinking oh. about what what could we as an industry as a publishing industry what can we do more either more of or can do better that will specifically put information and data into the hands of people who are researchers or who are policymakers or who can influence a change that will help us to achieve the SDGs mm. themselves. And like I said, well, one of the, the key things we've talked about is you know, partly education. So it turns out the UN SDGs aren't as well known in the US as they are in perhaps other territories. Um, we can cross the border into Canada, which we do quite often, and um, they're well known there. Yes. Uh, if I um, were talking to a a partner down in uh, Brazil last week, and the SDGs are part of their thinking and and really a part of the way they're designing their research programs for the future as well. So there's there's differing differing um, understanding of the SDGs. I think there's a lot of understanding of global challenges. So it's it's the format I think is something that perhaps they weren't aware of in the especially right. in the USA. Okay. 
Uh, yay us. <laughs> There's probably nothing um, we can dig into there as well, Bill, as to why that might be. Yeah. <laughs> um, what makes it unique for a commercial publisher such as yourself to attempt a collective model like this? You know, what 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 some of the what are like opportunities and challenges for for someone like TNF? I think for for TNF specifically, our profile with humanities and social sciences means that our program quite often is cast as a humanities program, but actually mm. spreads across all subject areas. So right. we, we do have a, a very developed program in medicine. We have a science and technology um, group of programs as well. But it's trying to imagine how those programs could come together under the banner of one of these particular targets or these goals. So, so that's been that's, that's particularly interesting. The challenge, of course, is that we are a, a commercial publisher. So quite often, collective publishing models are really focused on working with nonprofits. Yeah. So trying to tie the aspiration to to be a good player in the in the, this market, um, but to acknowledge that we are a, a commercial publisher to start with anyway. Um, but I don't think those two things necessarily mean we can't do good in the world. And I think trying to explain what our intention is uh, and really to try and really focus on what we're trying to achieve with the content and getting that content to a much broader um, audience, but also allowing opportunity for researchers who don't have access. That, but, but we're, we're a big platform, if you like. We're, we're available everywhere. You know, we have relationships with almost every institution globally. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the the opportunity for those researchers to either publish or access that content isn't spread equally. So so we have a role to play in making sure that we, we try these kinds of models and find the right kind of partners in terms of the institutions who will work with us and then who will continue to work with us to refine the model. Right. So you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the pilot starting with a fairly modest, you know, uh, goal of, I think you said 70 titles, right? That's right. Or it's, it's a, okay. So can you say, you know, to be viable for some, like a publisher the size of TNF, like where would that 70 need to be for, you know, a viable, a, a, a program that you'd like to see? Uh, oh, I see. Are you, are you asking what a sustainable level of investment would be? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually, um, it's about $900,000 globally. Okay. And the way that we wanted to form this initially, at least, was to, to try and bring together a relatively small group of contributors. So mm -hmm. we imagined that we would work with between 30 and 40 institutions. Um, when we started, we also imagined that there would primarily be what we call in the US, at least, R1s, possibly R2 institutions. So those with high funding levels and research focus um, who might want to lend their their purchasing power to uh, to the global audience and, and particularly to the global south. So that, that was how we started. Um, we thought it would be easier within a year to try and find between 30 and 40 institutions mm -hmm. to work with us than it would be to try and spread that across a much broader base. Yep. But when you start to think about sustainable or sustainability for a yep. library uh, for library budgets that we know are challenged as well, we, we knew that at some point we would either need to expand the con contributors to a much broader number mm -hmm. so that we can lower the individual contribution um, from each of those institutions. So, so that's what we'll be looking in terms of like phase two of the rollout. Okay. Um, what, what was interesting in that though, that the very first pledge that we got was actually from a very small humanities institution. So Vassar College. Oh, wow. And, and so we were you know, delighted. It, it surprised us, but it, it challenged our model from day one. It was like, okay, we, we built it to a, you know, accommodate different university sizes, but we really did imagine it would be probably 30 of the larger institutions that would support us globally. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we are delighted to see the diversity of interest, actually. You just heard from Jamie Hutchins, Director of Open Research Americas at Taylor & Francis. This episode was brought to you with generous support from Taylor & Francis. Join us next week when we talk about the various roles libraries play in open access funding, including purchasing trends and how OA models require unique and varied partnerships within an institution.
As always, underwriting opportunities for the Authority File podcast are directed by Choices Advertising Director Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced and edited by Choices Digital Media Producer Sabrina Kofer, with support from Digital Media Assistant Ashley Roy. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.